Okay, now let's have a deeper look into the cortex of the cerebellum, and I want to tell you about some of the important neurons that we find there. Uh, the principal neuron that we find in the cerebellum is a very large neuron called the Purkinje cell, and it's really a, one of the most beautiful neurons that you'll ever want to see under the microscope. It's a very large cell body that gives rise to these uh, incredibly complex branching patterns of dendrites. And this illustration, of course, cannot do justice to the uh, form and the beauty of the Purkinje cell in its dendritic arbor. Now, this Purkinje cell is the principal integrator of inputs that are coming into the cerebellar cortex. And it's receiving a massive input from the axons of these really tiny cells that account for the majority of the cells that we find in the cerebellum. The cells in question here are the granule cells of the cerebellum, very small types of, of neuronal cell bodies that grow an axon out towards the outer part of the cortex of the cerebellum, and then that axon splits into two parts. And now these two parts can grow for some considerable length in parallel along a folium that forms the folding of the cerebellar cortex. So these are called parallel fibers because they are growing in parallel to one another and parallel to the organization of the folia of the cerebellum. Now it's difficult to appreciate this fact in the illustration but the organization of the Purkinje dendrites are orthogonal to the parallel fibers that are running through them. In fact, if one were to look at a Purkinje cell, one would find a remarkable geometry to its dendrites. While most neurons in the brain grow dendrites in all different directions, the Purkinje cells grow their dendrites in a very narrow plane, much like the fingers of my hand are extending in a narrow plane. Well, I brought a little bit of a visual aid that hopefully will illustrate for you what these Purkinje cell dendrites actually look like. What I've brought to show you is my Purkinje neuron of the sea, as I like to think of this. Well, actually, no, this is not a Purkinje neuron. This is a sea fan, which is a type of coral that grows in the ocean waters. And what's distinctive about this sea fan is that the arborizations of its dendritic structure is restricted to a very narrow plane, in the same way that the dendrites of the Purkinje cells are constrained in a very narrow plane. Now what you have to imagine is this single plane is orthogonal to this massive system of parallel fibers. In fact, this input of parallel fibers to the Purkinje cells provides the most extreme form of convergence that we know about in neural circuits. Perhaps as many as 100,000 or even 200,000 individual parallel fibers will be running through this beautifully intricate latticework of dendrite that is arranged to sample these massive parallel fibers that are running through it. Let me tell you just a little bit now about the inputs and then that will get us into a bit of the neurochemistry and the physiology of how this circuitry works. Now the granule cells are getting input from mossy fibers. So here's a mossy fiber that's growing in and it's making uh, synaptic contact in a very particular uh, morphological structure that we call a glomerulus. Uh, here, and there are other interneurons involved as well that I won't take the time to mention. Uh, for now, I'll just emphasize that the mossy fiber, and again, that's all the inputs to the cerebellum except for that special inferior olivary input. These mossy fibers are synapsing on the dendrites of the granule cells, and this is an excitatory synapse, so the mossy fiber is exciting the granule cell. The granule cell gives rise to these massive parallel fibers that make an excitatory synaptic connection onto the dendrites of the Purkinje neuron. So the granule cell parallel fibers then are exciting the Purkinje cells. Well, the Purkinje cells send their axons 
uh, down through the white matter where they synapse on cells in the deep cerebellar nuclei. Now the synapse between the Purkinje cell and the deep cerebellar nucleus is an inhibitory synapse because the Purkinje cells release GABA as their neurotransmitter and they interact with receptors that mediate an inhibitory influence of that neurotransmitter in the deep cerebellar nucleus neuron. So notice we have uh, two excitatory connections in series and then an inhibitory connection which can fundamentally alter the way the deep cerebellar nucleus integrates its own input. One final special input to highlight here in this illustration and that would be the climbing fiber. So the climbing fiber is again derived from the inferior olivary nucleus and now in this figure we get a sense of why it's called the climbing fiber. This axon makes contact with a single Purkinje cell and then wraps its axons around the proximal dendrites of these Purkinje neurons with intimate contact suggesting a very powerful synaptic relationship between this climbing fiber and the Purkinje cell. Indeed it is one of the most powerful synapses that we know in the mammalian brain. Okay, let me take you through this circuitry again uh, in a somewhat schematic way and uh, try to help you understand uh, the nature of the computations that might be going on here. So let's look at the illustration that shows us the neurons and the synaptic inputs and talk once again through the connections that link the inputs to the cerebellum to the cortical circuits. So the inputs to the cerebellum in the form of the mossy fibers come and they make synaptic connections with the granule cells. They also send branches down into the deep cerebellar nuclei and they release excitatory transmitters. Now the granule cells give rise to these uh, long bifurcating axons that form these parallel fibers which then make synaptic connections with the Purkinje cells. And then the Purkinje neurons integrate those parallel fiber inputs and then send their axons down to the deep cerebellar nuclei where they release gamma amino butyric acid GABA onto the deep cerebellar nucleus neuron. Meanwhile there is a climbing fiber involved. So the climbing fiber uh, gives rise to inputs at both the level of the deep nuclei and also of course this very special intimate relationship between the climbing fiber and the proximal dendrites of the Purkinje cell where there's this massively strong excitatory connection. So we'll come back to this when we talk about plasticity in just a moment. But to put all this in action, I would suggest that we conceptualize these connections as consisting of a deep or a main excitatory loop and a cortical inhibitory loop that runs through the Purkinje neuron and back down to the deep cerebellar nucleus. So, so here's what I have in mind. There is excitatory input that comes into the deep cerebellar nucleus and meanwhile there is a transformation of that excitatory input into an inhibitory signal that can then modulate the output of that excitatory neuron from the deep cerebellar nucleus. And as we'll emphasize, the output from the cerebellum really comes from this deep nucleus. Okay, so uh, the Purkinje cell then is in a position to, to chop or to modulate the activity of that deep cerebellar nucleus neuron. And the way motor learning seems to work, and the way synaptic plasticity in the cerebellum seems to work, is to actually modify the strength of this inhibition that is conveyed from the Purkinje cell down into the deep cerebellar nucleus. Now, knowing that this is an inhibitory connection, if one imagined that motor learning is consistent with a stronger output from the cerebellum, one way to provide that stronger output would be to weaken this input coming down from the cerebellar cortex. So if we were to reduce that synaptic inhibition, we'd have the effect of actually strengthening this connection by which the deep cerebellar nuclei influence the operation of upper motor neuron circuits. Well, let's now have a look and see how this actually happens. So uh, here is a view of the circuitry, again, with a bit more realism attached to the dendrites of the Purkinje cell and the 
uh, relationship of the parallel fibers to those dendrites as well as the climbing fiber. Now imagine it were possible to do the following experiment where we can record from the dendrites of a Purkinje cell and uh, measure the postsynaptic response following activation of parallel fibers and climbing fibers. And if we do an experiment such that we combine low frequency stimulation of the climbing fiber at the same time that we activate the parallel fibers, what we find is that there is a depression of the strength of the synapse between the parallel fiber and the Purkinje cell that is expressed over the next uh, 10 to 20 minutes or so and can persist for a very long time. So the form of synaptic plasticity that we see here in the cerebellar cortex is long-term depression. And that can be measured here in this experimental record where there's a recording of the excitatory postsynaptic amplitude at the parallel fiber Purkinje cell synapse. And with conjoint stimulation of both climbing fiber and parallel fiber, now we see over time a decline to about 50% or so of the amplitude of that excitatory postsynaptic connection. The means by which this synapse is weakened should be somewhat familiar to you, although there are a few surprises in the metabolic cascade that leads to activation of the synaptic connections and the weakening of the synapse. The part that should be familiar to you is the notion that one way to weaken a synapse would be to internalize AMPA receptors. And indeed, this is the molecular mechanism that expresses long-term depression at this synaptic connection. The trigger that induces this internalization uh, is perhaps a bit unexpected. It involves glutamate, as have our other mechanisms of synaptic plasticity that we've discussed, except the NMDA receptor does not appear to be involved in this story. Rather, the receptor that mediates this phenomenon is a metabotropic glutamate receptor. And glutamate is released at the parallel fiber synapse. It interacts with this metabotropic receptor for glutamate, and this engages a cascade of second messenger systems that liberate calcium from intracellular stores. So there is a sudden increase in calcium following the activation of these second messenger systems. But that release of calcium doesn't seem to be sufficient to cause robust internalization of AMPA receptors. So we need to get more calcium into this postsynaptic spine rapidly. And the way that happens is through activation of our climbing fiber system. So with the activation of the climbing fiber, there will be a massive depolarization of this dendrite. Uh, again, the climbing fiber synapse is one of the strongest synapses that we know about within the central nervous system. So when the climbing fiber is active, there's this profound depolarization which will open up voltage-gated calcium channels, allowing an extra bolus of calcium to flood into that postsynaptic spine, further elevating the levels of calcium that we find. And once a sufficient amount of calcium uh, enters that spine, then yet additional second messenger systems will be engaged that lead to the activation of uh, phosphokinase C and other substrates of phosphorylation that lead to the internalization of these AMPA receptors and the reduction in synaptic strength. Now, please don't be confused about the mechanisms of plasticity that we've discussed so far. Just recognize that the molecular mechanisms that mediate plasticity in the cerebellum are distinct from those that we talked about in the cerebral cortex. In the cerebral cortex, high calcium leads to long-term potentiation, but in the cerebellum, high calcium leads to long-term depression.